All right, guys, so today we're going to talk about Gibbs Free Energy, um, which is basically the energy available to do work, and we're going to talk about kind of the components of that and what goes into that, and then uh, we'll calculate it in class. Okay, so energy is the ability to do work, and we're going to talk about the two different states of energy as well as the types of energy. So our two different states of energy or kind of forms energy can be in are potential energy or kinetic energy. So potential energy is that stored energy. If you're looking over here in the picture, you can see the energy that is trapped in this water, that water there trapped behind the dam would be a source of potential energy. It is stored, it's available for use. Kinetic energy would be the active energy or the energy of movement, okay, the release of that energy. So we've got uh, six different types of energy that we're going to talk about. The first type being mechanical energy. Mechanical energy is the energy of the objects moving or their restrained movement. For example, if I took a rubber band and I stretched it out, that would be a, a, um, a source of potential mechanical energy. It has potential stored energy in it, okay? and the, the mechanical energy is the energy of that object moving. So it has the potential to move. It has stored energy that will enable it to move. Okay, our next type of energy is nuclear energy. Nuclear energy is energy that is contained in the nucleus of an atom. Okay, so it is released during an atomic reaction. This is what's in an atomic bomb. This is what it powers a nuclear power plant that they're trying to harness into electrical energy, trying to change it from nuclear energy to electrical energy. Okay, so again, that is the energy in the nucleus of the atom. Chemical energy is the one we're going to focus on the most today. Okay, chemical energy is the energy that is stored in the chemical bonds. Okay, it can be released from those chemical bonds during chemical reactions, but it is stored, the potential form of that chemical energy is stored in the chemical bonds between the various elements. Um, electromagnetic energy, this is the energy found in electromagnetic waves, like radio waves or um, microwaves. That's the type of energy you would find there. Um, electrical energy. Electrical energy is going to be based upon the movement of electrons from point A to point B. And this is usually done along a wire. This is when we think of electricity. And for instance, back to that nuclear power plant example, we are trying, with the nuclear power plant, we are trying to harness the nuclear energy, the energy that's released from that nuclear reaction, um, and transform that into electrical energy that will travel along the wire to our homes. Okay, and so that's going to be based on the movement of electrons from point A to point B. And then the last type of energy is heat energy. And heat energy um, involves the movement of molecules. Okay, um, and that can, will come into play some when we're talking about our Gibbs free energy. So if you all remember our first law of thermodynamics, when we talked about ecology, that energy cannot be created or destroyed. It can only be transformed from one form to another. So that is key that we remember. It cannot be created or destroyed, only transformed from one form to the other. Okay? Um, if you look at this picture here, you can see some of the energy conversions that are happening here. We've got, within the lawnmower itself, we've got some chemical energy going to mechanical, right? The chemical energy of the gas okay, turning into the mechanical energy of the mower actually moving, whether that's the parts of the mower moving, you know, the, the piston and the wrote the blade of the motor, you know, of the lawnmower actually rotating, um, as well as the chemical energy of the gas, allowing for the mechanical, physical movement of the uh, push mower. Okay? There's radiant energy, you know, as the energy from the sun is coming down to the grass. So radiant energy that is being uh, transformed into um, chemical energy, into photosynthesis. Okay, so a variety of chemical, uh, not chemical, a variety of energy transformations happening in just this simple picture here. Our second law of thermodynamics um, was about uh, the loss of uh, that during that energy transformation. How some of the energy is going to be lost in the form of heat um, in the form of heat energy. Remember, we talked when we talked about our second law of thermodynamics about entropy and the increase in disorder. So as those energy conversions are occurring, some of the usable energy. 
Okay, so some of that usable energy is converted into unusable energy, usually in the form of heat energy. You can look here at this engine in the, uh, in the car. So the energy input, the chemical energy of the gasoline, okay, so our energy transformation is that chemical energy to mechanical energy, okay, and a lot of that is lost as unusable heat energy. Okay, right here you can see that 75% of it is lost as unusable heat energy. Heat energy can only do work if there is a heat gradient. If there is not a heat gradient, then the heat energy is unusable and it cannot do any work. So free energy is the energy that's available to do work. And free energy is always, always, always going to be less than the total energy of the system. You cannot have more energy available to do work than what is in the system in general. Remember in ecology we talked about closed systems versus open systems. <coughs> and we're going to compare those. Uh, we're going to look a little bit at those now. Okay. But our free energy, again, is going to be the energy that's available to do work. And again, it will always be less than the total energy available in the system. You can look here in this closed system diagram uh, picture that we have here. It started off with 100% usable energy, 0% unusable energy. Every time there was an energy transformation, chunks of this is lost as unusable energy, where eventually in a closed system, because a closed system does not exchange energy with its, uh, does not exchange with its surroundings, eventually in a closed system you're going to end up with zero usable energy, okay, which does not usually work out well uh, for a closed system. This is part of why living systems are open systems. They allow for energy transfer. So like we said, in a closed system, there is a there's going to be a decrease in the amount of free energy that's available to do work. Um, and as that free energy decreases, that will actually increase the entropy. And remember, entropy was our disorder or chaos. So for instance, in this picture here, this is a, a closed system. It's a building. Okay, and you can see the change in the building over time, that increase in disorder or that increase in entropy as the building is broken down. Okay, the parts of the building are broken down and they start to crumble and they start to rust and they're starting to um, you know, basically fall apart. Um, so in a closed system, which the universe is a closed system, Okay, so the universe is a closed system, and so the universe eventually is having has a constant increase in entropy. Okay, and so the free energy available to do work in the universe is um, decreasing while the entropy is increasing. However, Earth is not a closed system. Earth is an open system because Earth is constantly receiving energy from the sun. And so the, the entire universe is closed, but Earth is open. So Earth is exchanging energy with the sun. It's receiving energy from the sun. So Earth is getting an, an input of energy. So even though the entropy is increasing and the disorder and the chaos are increasing, there is an influx of energy available. And there's an influx of energy available. And so we hopefully are not going to exhaust our supply of free energy anytime soon. So if we apply this to one of the biology concepts that you guys are hopefully pretty familiar with, diffusion here, so you can see on the left here we have this beaker that actually has more free energy because the molecules are concentrated in one area. Okay, so because they are concentrated there in one particular area on one side of the membrane, I don't know, it's hard to see, but there's a plastic bag in there. On one side of the membrane, those molecules are said to have more free energy because they are concentrated on one side and they are more organized there. So it has more free energy. As those molecules begin to diffuse and spread across the membrane, okay, we actually end up with less free energy because the molecules are now less organized. So we have our increase in entropy there. Okay? So we have an increase in disorder, therefore we have a decrease in free energy energy available to do work. That's, um, if you kind of think about it in the sense of a gradient, you know, the gradient, okay, that gradient allows for work to be done. That difference in concentration on one side versus the other side of the membrane, again, allows for work to occur. So all living, in, uh, all living organisms are going to need a source of free energy to live. 
They have to have an input of free energy to live, grow, and reproduce, even though they do obey the first and second laws of thermodynamics. Okay? They do not create energy. They can only do energy transformations, and they do obey that second law of thermodynamics um, in that we are basically increasing the disorder, the entropy of the system. So your autotrophs, they're going to get that input of energy from the sun, that input of radiant energy. Your heterotrophs, they're going to get that input of energy from consumption of food okay, in the form of chemical energy. But once the organism dies, it's no longer using the free energy. So, um, like for instance, you can see the fungus here that are breaking down this um, dead log that has fallen from the tree there. Once that um, portion of the tree there has died, it is no longer using free energy, and that's actually going to increase the entropy of the system because that um, free that organism that has died is going to get decomposed. So this log that's getting decomposed, that is actually increasing the entropy of the system. So the living organisms are obeying these laws of thermodynamics. Okay, so let's take a look at how that energy is in those chemical bonds. So Chemical reactions are going to, and that's one of the things you're looking at with your labs and as we're going through all this biochemistry, okay, we're talking a lot about chemical reactions. And chemical reactions um, are, all they are, are the breaking of bonds and the forming of new ones. So bonds are broken, new ones are formed. In this uh, picture here, these are my reactants right here, okay, and so bonds here are broken, bonds here are broken, and then down here with my products, new bonds are formed. Okay, so that's all a chemical reaction is. And during that chemical reaction, energy could possibly be captured and stored in the bonds, or it could be released from the bonds. The energy of activation is that energy that is used to break the bonds and the reactants so that they can be reformed. Okay, we've talked about um, activation energy as kind of what gets the chemical reaction going. Okay, well, the chemical reaction can't get going if we don't break the bonds in the reactants. Okay, if the reactants never break apart, then they, can't, um, then they can't be reformed into something new. On the graph here, you can see um, this, it required this input here of free energy to break these bonds between molecule A and B and C and D so that they can be reformed here in these different products. Okay, and so that particular amount of free energy is our activation energy. That's what our um, enzymes help to lower. Our enzymes help make it so they don't need as much input of energy to be able to break those bonds between those reactants. Okay, so let's talk for a second then about what enthalpy is, because all of these things are going to impact the amount of energy that's available. So enthalpy, okay, so enthalpy up here, all right, this is the heat content of our chemical compounds. Okay, so enthalpy is the heat content of the, chemo uh, content of the chemical compounds. That actually equals the total potential energy of the molecule. So enthalpy is our total potential energy of any given molecule. I'm going to run out of space. So if a chemical reaction heats its surroundings, then the energy released is at the expense of the enthalpy of the reacting molecule. Okay, let's, let's kind of let's say that again. So if we do a chemical reaction and it heats up its surroundings, then that energy that was released, that heat energy that was released, was at the expense of the molecules that did the reacting. Okay, those lost some of their enthalpy. Okay, let's take a look at this reaction that we have written here on this um, picture. So we are talking about the combustion, so basically methane gas catching on fire. Okay, um, so it releasing heat energy. So the burning of methane gas releases heat energy. So here's my formula for methane. Okay, when I add it with that oxygen, okay, here's my, um, there's my reactants, methane and oxygen. Okay, my products are carbon dioxide and water. And my bonds have to be broken. To break the bonds, I know this is counterintuitive for a lot of you, because a lot of you think when I'm, going to, um, when I'm going to break a bond, I would release energy. But remember, it has to absorb energy to break the bonds. If you think back to that activation energy, you can't break the bonds. Like this is my reactant right here, this carbon and hydrogen. And that carbon and hydrogen, okay, is, they're linked. 
Those, that carbon with four hydrogens, I don't have room to draw a methane here. Let me try that again. So this carbon is linked to these four hydrogen molecules here, all by covalent bonds. So it actually has to absorb energy to be able to break those bonds there. So to absorb, and these numbers right here, you are, like all these numbers, the value of how much energy it takes to break a bond between carbon and hydrogen, you don't have to, you're not going to have to memorize that. If they want you to calculate that, they will give you those numbers. Okay, but that's what these numbers are. So it takes 90 kil kilocalories per mole to break the bond between carbon and hydrogen, and I have to do that four times. So that's three, an input of 392 kilocalories per mole. To break the oxygen bonds, that's an input of 116 kilocalories per mole, and I had two oxygen molecules. So I needed an input of 624 kilocalories per mole uh, to break apart those reactants. To reform those reactants into my new products, though, okay, I'm going to release some energy. There's going to be some energy left over, basically, when I make the new bonds. So when I make the new bonds between carbon and oxygen, okay, I've got 187 kilocalories per mole left over. And I made, um, and I did that twice. Okay? I bonded a carbon to an oxygen two times because okay, it's CO2. Okay, so I end up with 374 uh, kilocalories per mole of energy that's released. And then if I made two water molecules, that means I've bonded, it's, you know, you guys should be very familiar now with the shape of water, right? I bonded one oxygen to two. I did, for each water molecule, I have two hydrogen-oxygen bonds. And since I'm making two water molecules in total, I've got four hydrogen-oxygen bonds. So now I'm at a total of 440 kilocalories per mole. So my total energy products here is 814 kilocalories per mole. So my net energy here, okay, my change in energy here, was the amount of energy I had to put in minus the amount of energy got, I, got, I got out of it. So I actually get a negative um, enthalpy here. Okay? So I'm calculating my net energy, which actually is negative, which means that energy was released. Okay? So a negative value means that energy was released, whereas a positive value would mean that energy had to be absorbed. Okay, so um, again, a decrease in enthalpy or a negative change in enthalpy. Again, I don't know why it changed my D to a did my change of triangle to a D. Okay, so a negative change in enthalpy, and in case you haven't caught on either, okay, your H is enthalpy. Okay, so a negative change in enthalpy is an exothermic reaction. It's releasing heat. Okay, an increase in enthalpy or a positive, again it should be delta, positive change in enthalpy. A or H is an endothermic reaction. Take the water example right here. Okay, so um, if I have a beaker of water sitting out at room temperature, would it evaporate? Yes, it would. Okay, so if we're again we're talking evaporation of this beaker of water here. So it is a favored reaction. It is known to occur. We know that if I left a, a beaker of water out, eventually it would you know it would evaporate. Okay, so if we think about this, so Let's think about what we know. We know this is favored because we know it occurs. Okay? Um, we need to think about is heat enthalpy absorbed or released? Well, in this instance, heat enthalpy is absorbed. Therefore, now actually it is, that makes it an endothermic reaction. It has a positive change in enthalpy, right? It has a positive de delta H, which actually now makes it not favorable. Okay, but we know it occurs, so it has to be favored somehow. Okay, well, let's think about our next point there. Is um, water in a gas form more or less organized than liquid water? Well, water in a gas form is less organized. Okay, is that favored? Yes, because that's an increase in entropy. And remember, that's a law of thermodynamics. So that is favored. Okay, so we've got an overall... Um, favored reaction, er, an overall release of free energy because we know it occurs. Okay? So we've got these two factors here that are, that are contributing to uh, whether this reaction is going to happen or not, the free energy. And okay? we've got the entrop entropy factor, okay? which is that organization factor, and we've got the enthalpy factor. And in this case, the entropy factor is greater. It's winning out, and so evaporation still occurs even though heat 
is absorbed and is in an endothermic reaction, which is unfavorable. So let's look at exergonic versus endergonic. So before we were talking exothermic and endothermic, so we were talking specifically about heat. Exergonic, okay, so exergonic and endergonic reactions, those are talking about free energy. So exergonic reactions release free energy to the surroundings, where an exothermic reaction releases heat, negative change in enthalpy, right? Endergonic reactions absorb free energy, where an endothermic reaction has a positive change in enthalpy. It's absorbing heat. Okay? So exergonic and endergonic reactions, we can calculate this change in energy. Um, and Again, it's changed all my triangles um, to uh, Ds. So the D is for delta, right? Because remember, that's what the triangle stands for. So... Okay, so I've got my changes in free energy. They can be calculated by using my um, final energy minus my initial energy, or, I don't know where that just came from, okay. or, again, delta, or my change in energy can be calculated by using my change in enthalpy, okay, remember H is enthalpy, minus temperature, times the change, this is a mess, no D's, don't write any D's on your paper, okay, so the change in energy, let's cover up that D even more, my change in energy, that's my G, energy for Gibbs, okay, change in energy equals my change in enthalpy, because H is enthalpy, minus temperature, Okay, minus temperature, absolute temperature, so that means it would be in kelvins, right? Absolute temperature, which, again, it's got to be in kelvin because it's absolute temperature, times my change, okay, times my change in S, which is entropy. Oh, I just totally ran out of room. So you can see how both factors impact our change in energy, the change in the enthalpy as well as the change in entropy. Okay? And then again, you have to factor in temperature as well. So let's look at how this energy applies to some of um, our cells and how we transfer energy around uh, in living organisms. So most energy is uh, moved around in the cells uh, via the transfer of phosphates okay, using ATP. Okay, so let's look at our ATP diagram here, make sure we understand, you know, what it looks like and what parts, of, what the parts are of it here, because this is our most common phosphate carrier. We have other ones, um, uh, GD, uh, GTP, um, so we have some others, but let's, we're going to focus on ATP. So the structure of ATP is, um, it's a modified nucleotide, okay, remember your nucleotide is your monomer of nucleic acid, sugar, phosphate, nitrogen base. So it's a modified nucleotide. It's got your uh, sugar here, okay? It's got your ribose sugar. It's got your nitrogen base there. And it has three phosphate groups instead of just one. And, you know, regular nucleotide only has one phosphate group. So it has three phosphate groups um, that are um, held together here at the end with very weak bonds. Because if you look, these all of these phosphate groups have a negative charge. And so they're actually repelling one another. Okay? And so they have um, weak bonds that hold them together. And those bonds are actually, even though they're not a very strong bond, they are considered a high energy bond holding these phosphate groups together here. And so when the phosphate group is removed, so when one of these phosphate groups is released there, okay, energy is released. It's an exergonic reaction. So the removal of the phosphate group is an exergonic reaction, okay, which remember releases energy. You can see that happening here in this picture. I have my ATP here on the far left. Okay, when I remove that phosphate group, you notice the phosphate is moved, removed here, it's an ADP, I had a release of energy. Okay, I um, have a negative enthalpy, okay, negative uh, 7.3 there, okay, so I've released energy. 
Um, and that energy can be coupled with a reaction that is endergonic. So if I couple this exergonic reaction with an endergonic reaction, then I can um, use that, I can use the energy from the um, breaking of the ATP basically to fuel my endergonic reaction and make it overall an exergonic reaction so that it becomes energetically uh, favorable. So if my first reaction is endergonic and not favorable, not energetically favorable because it absorbs energy, but if I couple that with ATP so that my now my net reaction, so my overall reaction is exergonic and energetically favorable, then it will occur. So you can see here I've got a couple of reactions that are coupled here. Okay? I've got, um, I'm assuming that's uh, glutamine maybe with the... Um, with a, um, fa, uh, an ammonia group, okay? And so this is, okay, this is gonna require energy. It's an, in, um, it's an endergonic reaction, so it requires an energy, um, energy input. It needs to be absorbed. But when I couple this with the transfer of that phosphate, so when I um, remove the phosphate from my ATP, okay, and I do what's called phosphorylation, that's when I add a phosphate to something else, so I phosphorylate that glutamine here, okay, that transfer of energy results in an over, overall favorable reaction that has, as you can see there, has a negative enthalpy. And so that be, now becomes an overall exergonic reaction. If you think about photosynthesis and cellular respiration, photosynthesis overall is endergonic. Okay? It, re it's an absor it requires an absorption of energy. Okay, um, the energy is coming from the sun, okay, and, and cellular respiration overall is exergonic. Okay, and so coupling those two together okay, and controlling uh, the release through cellular respiration okay, allows that to be an overall exergonic process. In our bodies, or in any, you know, any organism, metabolism is the sum of all of the biochemical reactions that are happening in that cell. Okay? Um, we've got kind of two basic type, types of uh, reactions. We have what are considered anabolic reactions and catabolic reactions. Uh, anabolic reactions are reactions that build things up. Okay? So they are usually endergonic. To build something up it would usually take an influx of energy. All right, where catabolic reactions um, are reactions that break things down, and so those are usually going to be exergonic. When they break things down, we release that energy out. So all we have here are just some more examples showing you of how that um, energy from uh, that's released by the breaking of ATP can be harnessed to make these um, overall net exergonic reactions. And again, all of this together would be our metabolism. These inter all of these reactions happening together. So, for instance, when I phosphorylate a, um, a membrane protein there in a cell, okay, that can be then used to transport solute across that energy there can be used to transport solute, solute across. Okay? It can be used for these motor proteins that um, will move things along the cytoskeleton. Okay? Again, when they're phosphorylated, okay, that allows that um, motor protein to uh, harness that as mechanical work. Um, same with uh, when certain organisms, when certain molecules are phosphorylated, okay, it may allow for chemical reactions and chemical work to occur. So spontaneous reactions are re reactions that are energetically favorable and they don't require outside energy. Basically, they don't require an in, um, outside energy to make them happen or an input of outside energy. Um, our systems in general are going to move from high energy to low energy. And that's going to kind of dictate these spontaneous reactions. Spontaneous reactions are usually exothermic. A lot of times, um, so most of the time, they're going to release heat. Okay? Um, you can see examples of them here. We had a hydrogen balloon here that was uh, bursting. This is what you guys are doing during your enzyme lab. Okay? The hydrogen peroxide mixed with the catalase. It is a spontaneous reaction. It does not require um, outside energy. It could also be a very slow reaction. Um, oxidation, rust. Okay, um, that exposure of iron to oxygen takes a long time for that to rust, but it is still a spontaneous process. It's not requiring input of outside energy. 
Um, if we take it back to that diffusion example um, we talked about in um, evaporation of water examples, when we were talking about the water evaporating, that it being a favorable reaction, okay, over time that beaker of water is going to evaporate. We had to absorb enough energy for the molecules to then have enough energy to escape and become a gas. But remember, we uh, talked about they favored being a gas. That was favorable for them. Okay? It was an endothermic reaction because it um, absorbed heat, but it is also a spontaneous reaction. Okay? It's going from a high energy state to a low energy state. Okay? Um, and so um, it's taking into account, again, that factor of entropy and not just um, enthalpy. So we um, look at how a reaction can be spontaneous or exergonic. Okay, we've already talked about these equations. Again, remember, no Ds. These should all be triangles. No Ds. Triangles. Change. Okay, um, remind you again, uh, G is our free energy. H is our enthalpy. T is our absolute temperature. So it has to be in Kelvin. S is our entropy. So we can see here on these diagrams, we've got decreasing free energy um, due to a, lot, a number of things. Okay, we can change any of these things, and still we're going to end up with a decrease in free energy. So our enthalpy, um, so our enthalpy here, decreasing. Entropy is increasing, but overall, still we have a decrease in free energy. Here we've got enthalpy is now increasing this time, but the entropy, the increase in entropy here outweighs that by a significant amount, so there's still an overall loss of free energy, decrease in free energy here. Okay? And then again, large um, decrease in enthalpy okay, with a slight decrease in entropy. Let's talk about temperature. Okay? So if I increase my temperature, okay, then I'm going to um, increase my entropy factor. I'm going to increase my S, my entropy factor. Because temperature is a measure of the random motion of the molecules. We talked about heat energy before. Okay? Temperature is a way we measure heat. So we're talking about our um, random motion of the molecules. And that random motion of the molecules it disrupts the order of my system. This is why um, the gaseous state of water is, um, has more entropy, is less organized. Okay? Because there's the random motion there, there's more freedom of motion there. There's more disruption of my system. Think proteins. Okay. When a protein loses its shape, so a protein, you know, has its normal conformation that it has, and when it loses its shape, entropy increases. So if I have a protein, okay, it denatures, it loses its shape or conformation, okay, I'm going to have an increase in entropy. Okay. Um, and that change in, and I'm also going to have a change in enthalpy, and that's going to oppose my entropy because I had to absorb some heat to break those bonds. Okay, so the hydrogen bonds that were holding that protein together, I had to absorb some energy there to um, absorb some heat to break those bonds. However, my entropy is decreased. Okay, so I definitely, uh, I'm sorry, my entropy is increased because I lost the shape of my protein. I increased my disorder. So if my temperature exceeds a certain point and those hydrogen bonds break, they cannot absorb any more heat. Entropy now wins, therefore I have a decrease in free energy. Okay? So my entropy still wins, um, and I get that decrease in free energy no matter what. Okay, let's look at that in the graph form here. Again, no Ds should all be triangles. Okay? So I'm looking at my change in G, remember, which is my free energy. Okay, no Ds, only G, only Gs, triangles, change in G. So if my change in G is less than zero, or I have a negative delta G, I have a negative change in G here, I have an exergonic reaction. Okay, so I can see this on this first graph here. Here's my reactants. Okay, my um, my energy here, okay, my potential energy of my molecules has um, decreased. Okay, so I had an output of energy. My products have less energy than my reactants did. It's an exergonic reaction. 
on the one over here on the right, I have an intergonic reaction. So I've got my potential energy of my reactants, okay? um, my energy now of my products. So my products actually absorbed energy, and so I have an endergonic reaction. So my change in energy is greater than zero. Look at these. I'm not going to color over the Ds. By now, you should know that the Ds are triangles. Okay, so let's kind of look at these a uh, couple of examples here. Okay, I've got calcium chloride and water. Okay, um, and when I do that, both of these reactions, so both this reaction as well as this reaction, they are spontaneous, and free energy is decreasing. Okay, um, so I've got a free energy decrease here. It's an exergonic reaction, but it's actually exothermic, and it's actually exothermic as well. Okay, so I have a negative change in enthalpy, okay, and then I've got my change in my entropy. Okay, this one here, okay, the um, nitrogen and the chloride here, it's an exergonic reaction again, but this one is endothermic. It absorbs heat. Okay, if you look at my enthalpy change, but my entropy change is greater, therefore I still have my negative um, change in energy. Let's look at some examples real quick of decreasing free energy. Uh, so the first one we have here is this girl going down the slide here. So she goes from something being less stable to more stable. Okay, that's kind of our, our definition there. We're going from less stable to more stable, from a high energy state to a low energy state. So at the top of the slide here, she has way more potential energy than she does here at the bottom. She went from a high energy state, anything about how fast she could go down that slide, to a low energy state. Um, with our second example here, we're talking about diffusion. So on one side of the membrane, the molecules are more, organi more organized, okay? and so on the other side, on, on the next set, as they diffuse across that membrane there, okay, I get more disorganization, I get my increase in entropy, so I have an overall decrease in the free energy available. The energy available, remember, free energy, our energy available to do work. Okay, there is more energy stored in these concentrated molecules than when they start to spread out and become more disorganized. Um, the last example over here is decomposition. So I have a chemical reaction taking place. So my products here have less energy. So my products have less energy than my reactants. Okay, and so as they went through the chemical reaction, my change in free energy here uh, decreased again. So aside from just impacting molecules, um, this impact of entropy and free energy availability and stuff can impact the entire living system, not just the cell or the molecule. Um, we're talking about like ATP or chemical reaction here. Okay, um, so we've already talked about um, how it can impact membranes and how that concentration gradient can um, build up free energy, right? I've got more free energy on this side. If you think, when we talk about um, nervous system, we talk about pumps, we talk about energy available to do work because we build up these concentration gradients. We get into photosynthesis and respiration, you'll see that as well. We'll talk about building up these gradients so that we can do work storing this potential energy. And as those gradients disappear due to diffusion and we get closer to equilibrium, we actually have a decrease in the free energy available. Our circulatory system is impacted by this. Okay? The differences in concentration okay, on oxygen and carbon dioxide between the blood and the lungs is what fuels um, those, the movement of those. Okay? And so my concentration gradient here between carbon dioxide and my lungs is great enough that it increases the disorder Okay. When the carbon dioxide diffuses into the lungs, it spreads that carbon dioxide out and it increases the disorder. So entropy is impacting my circulatory system. Okay. Same with um, when the blood picks up the oxygen. Now I have an increase in oxygen in my blood, increased concentration in oxygen in my blood as compared to my cells. As they diffuse across the membrane, I increase my entropy. Okay. And so that's impacting our systems as a whole. It also impacts the excretory system. Okay, so in the excretory system, um, so basically when we produce urine, most of the molecules in the extra excretory system uh, move based upon diffusion. I'm going to try to write that again so it will actually maybe fit. Oh, I don't know what's happening here. Okay, oh, that's diffusion. 
Okay, so most of the molecules move um, due to diffusion. And again, remember, entropy is the driving force behind diffusion. It's increasing disorder. And so if these molecules are diffusing, I'm increasing my entropy. I'm decreasing my free energy. And then same with ecosystems. Entropy affects the ecosystem as a whole. You know, um, in the, the entropy and that, that second law of thermodynamics, as we talk about how things move from one trophic level to another, we talk about how we have 10% of the energy that is transferred from one, energy, one level to the next, and that is dependent upon a couple of things. Okay? So, first of all, not all of the energy consumed at the level below is going to be transferred um, to the next level. So all of the energy that is, um, all of the, the grasshoppers here are not going to eat all of the grass. They're not going to eat every single ounce of the grass. So not all of the energy um, is going to be consumed at the level below. The energy transformations are going to cause, like we've talked, like that we've talked about before, that the energy transformations cause a lot of that energy to be used as heat, okay? And so it is not going to be, um, it's not all going to be um, you transformed into usable energy. And when we lose that, when that energy is transformed into unusable energy, that increases our entropy. Again, a driving force. So we'll be working some more with this in class, looking at examples, applying it, and possibly calculating some of these things.